Hi, it's me, Neil Brennan. This is the Blocks Podcast. We talk about what makes people feel like something's wrong with them, and then they reveal their inner life, and then you get to compare it to your inner life. And people like it. Today's guest is a great comedian uh, who I probably, I don't know when we met, maybe the early 2000s. I was aware of you in the early 90s. You Weren't you on an episode of Arsenio with Dave Chappelle, Ellen yes. DeGeneres, yes. and Mark Curry? Yes. I remember that. Yes. And uh, she's a real, all the words now are just like, that we're old. You're a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. Thank you for agreeing with me. It's, yeah. No, but it's true. It's just yeah. like you are. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Margaret Cho, everybody. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. You are a very, in my estimation, a very original person. And there's not a lot of people like you. Mm. The thing I've always wondered was like, was it easy to be that? Was it, a lot of people, it's just involuntary. Like, I yeah. can't help it. This is who I am. Did you have to like find your actual self? I think so to some degree. Kind of when I was starting doing comedy in the 80s, there uh -huh. was no Asian comedians. So there was always this concern of, well, should I do comedy about being Asian? It seems obvious, but is that something that I should do or should I let him lean out to it? Everything that was happening was all about observational comedy, mm -hmm. which is is somewhat mathematical, is somewhat um, identity-less. Yeah. You know, and so you wanted to see if uh, your ability could be judged outside your identity. So then I was like, maybe I should just not talk about it at all. But then that was weird too. Do you feel like there were a lot of identity comedians? It was like identity or observational. Those are the two options. Yes. And then identity was di diluted too because all of the really popular people were character comedians yeah. like Bobcat Goldthwait and to some extent Paula Poundstone, who is my absolute favorite. She's very funny. She's very funny. But in a way, a kind of a character comedian, in a way, because she comes and presents... Um, as somebody very unique, so unique that this has got to be a character, but she's actually like that. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, is she doing a character? Because I don't, I'm like, I thought, I kind of think she's like that, but at the same time, I'm like, she's could like she that. be like, yeah. She's like that, but it also is so unique that it could present as a character. So yeah. identity was formed in character. So character comics like Emo Phillips and Judy Tenuta were the gold standard at the time. If you think about what's really yeah. popular, that and then, Seinfeld on the other side and Gary Shandling on the other side. Right. Were you aware that you were making this decision or were you just like, oh, I just have this new bit and I'm going to do it? Yeah. So I wasn't I wasn't sure like where I should go. And then you have to think ultimately I just have to write jokes and whatever lands lands. So then okay. it was just about doing a bunch of jokes and seeing what was funny. And how how has it been to be you? Pretty cool. <laughs> Pretty cool, although. And I'm not even saying like in career. I mean like in yeah. life. In, I get well, pretty cool. But I've had my own problems, you know, that I've self created. All of my problems really are totally made up by myself. Self generated. Yeah, <laughs> like I have had it pretty easy when it comes to like career and work, and and in my mind, I've had it pretty easy. Did you always think that? Yeah, because I was always able to just make a living. Yeah, let me clar so, let me clarify. So you probably started your full time comedian 89, 80, 90. 89, yeah. 88, 89, yeah. And then you got a sitcom. So there's like a little money. Yeah. <laughs> and then you were sort of like, I had a sitcom. That was like a your identity for like a mm -hmm. year. And then it was like too Asian. Was or that not Asian enough? Or not Asian enough. Or right. then they tried to sort of make it a uh like a, a friends style, mm -hmm. you know, Gen X kind of comedy. and Which worked for Ellen's show. Yeah, that really worked for them. And we yeah. were in the same, you know, lot and we were in the same air, like arena pretty much, you know, the same network. Yeah. So, um, but that didn't work for us. And um, there were no uh, roles for Asian Americans, really. I couldn't do uh, martial arts at all. <sighs> so I couldn't get any of those Power Rangers <laughs> Jobs. Huge mistake. <laughs> Sad. I wish I had I wish I had the ability, you yeah. know, to do any of that stuff. And um so I was just doing comedy, but comedy paid off. Like yeah. I, I really loved it. And like I said before we started rolling, it's like Margaret was the first person or with the first one, one of the early people that I was aware of, like, 
you figured out who liked you Mm -hmm. and you serviced those people. Mm -hmm. And it was young women, gay dudes, and I'm sure I'm forgetting lots of, not like that's it, but I'm saying like chiefly that. Lots of different, well, it's lots of different people. It's anybody sort of who feels outside, an outsider. It's uh, a way to bring together people who feel like they don't fit in, which Mm -hmm. is actually everyone too. So sometimes audience, the the demographics can surprise me as well. Like it's skews like younger and older than I realize. Mm -hmm. So I love that. It's really kind of become much more broad. I did a show in Boston and I was looking at the the camera on the entrance and it looked, I wouldn't have guessed that anyone was there to see me. Like when I saw them (laughs) on the street, I'd be like, he's definitely not coming to mind. It looked like January 6th. It was so many fat white dudes. I I was astounded by it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um but uh but thanks fat white dudes i appreciate it um and and then also like the people i would have thought mm-hmm. like the sort of more marginalized people which is like great also so and uh, comedy fans like that's yeah, that's a new yes. era too of like people who really are uh very um savvy uh, savvy and purposeful in their love of comedy mm-hmm. and then they really curate these incredible yeah. uh interests and a uh, cults around comedians and you can also see if you live in most major cities you can see a very good comedian every month if not every week oh yeah yeah um so you felt like the career stuff was going good and then personally like even personally it never my 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 uh tangential dealings with you seemed like you weren't doing things normally Mm -hmm. is that would you agree yes i think so Uh, and and what was that like was it just finding your way i know relationships you've tried like a few different approaches am i making that up yeah so i've had uh, a number of relationships uh, all of them terrible and everything every time i've tried to connect with another human being uh in a romantic way it's always been terrible and so now i realize i'm not going to do that anymore like i just have pulled that part of my life out so there's nothing like that happening anymore can you walk us through some of the different approaches so i was married okay. and i was a uh, polyamorous in my marriage which actually kind of worked for a long time until it it really didn't and that but it was always this thing of like trying to um make something work when it really wasn't going to work because the person i was with was incredibly jealous so it's so hard to You knew that ahead of time? Yeah. And what did he say? Like I can I'm I can deal with it? Well, he could deal with it when he would have other partners, but he Isn't couldn't deal with it when way? I would. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we tried to make it work for like 12 years, and it just didn't, you know, it was unfortunate because we were well matched. We got along really well, and he was a great person, but the the um I guess the mission statement of the marriage was false. We could not make polyamory work. Were there ever ones where like he was like, okay, I'm not jealous. I don't know why. This one doesn't bother me. It would all bother him. So it was too bad because we really tried and he really tried, but it was just like, we can't make something work just on a theory that this is going to happen. Well, yeah, if you can't physically do it, if your emotions aren't calibrated to be okay with it. Yeah. Here's my question for anyone who's done polyamory. What do you do when you know the person is somewhere sleeping with another person? <laughs> like, how can you go to the gym? What can you do? Yeah, you, you can do? do anything else. You can go on another date. You can go do something else. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, but that feels like retaliatory. Yeah, that's true. I think it really just is about, um, I don't know, like having your own life that can compartmentalize well. And you could also do things together as a polycule, which polycule. I enjoy. God, tell us more. What is that? A polycule is a unit of relationships evolve, of evolving around, revolving and evolving around a primary polyamorous relationship. So you have your primary partner and then you have other partners who are satellites. And then when you can all come together in a kind of a like a softball team or a family reunion, some kind of unit, bowling, whatever, that's actually great. And so uh, we had a polycule of people with his partners, but he could never include one of mine because it was just too threatening. So So it would be you and him Mm -hmm. and then- Another person. 
one other woman? Yes, that worked well. You and her would speak for most of the time? Yeah, most of the time. And it was great. I actually really loved our polycule. Like uh, that was actually probably of all the relationships that was the most successful when we had uh, an extra person to, because we didn't have children. So that was sort of like, Oh, we have when we and she was nineteen. <laughs> no, but yeah. she was, she was great, and so I really loved her, and I'm still, I'm still very fond of her today. It's weird because that might be as the more natural, that's the connected relationship. Like mm-hmm. you can interact, and you guys have this shared thing, and yeah. she doesn't want them. No, and you do, but are happy to share. Yeah, and we had the best time. We, vacations. Um, no vacations, but just lots of times at home, watching movies, uh, going out to see movies, going and having meals, um, everything like that. Would you ever farm out sex with him like a chore? Like, go go jerk him off real quick. <laughs> no, but- I'm very childish. It would be um, implied, <laughs> you know, like Im- implied, like- it was it was great. Like you know? you'd be like, I gotta go to the post office, and then you you'd assume something would happen. Like well, like roommates in a weird it way. It was really roommates. It was really roommates. And my home was is really large, so it could accommodate things that were happening in other rooms that you would just not even know, which is good. Would you get a pang of jealousy, which was no. interesting, or you would just be like, well, no, people are sexual and they want to have multiple partners. Yeah, sexual. I wasn't. I'm not, I, I have been, I've realized that I've become very jealous as I've gotten older in la- later life. But Why? Back that then, seems like the opposite of most. Yeah. Because I've gone the uh, total other way. Now I'm super jealous, but then now I'm not having anything. So it doesn't matter. Why are you jealous now, do you think? I think now um, for something intimate to happen, it's got to be, uh, it's so important to me f- to want to. Also, as I've gotten older, my desire for sex has completely gone away. And so now I have to look to why do I even want sex or intimacy in the first place? Like, what does that even mean? Like, it's weird. I think my relationship to sexuality has really shifted. I'm really interested in that because if you, it's like who, how much are we defined by that? So much. And then once it's taken away, you Mm kind of go, what is, what am I, what are my interests? Right. That's why I like when like women in their 50s start gardening more and they like dress differently. Yes. Is that a woman's natural, is that her natural state? Yeah. Or is that just like uh, her natural state is whatever she's experiencing chemically? I think that the natural state for me is gardening. I love gardening. That's so funny. I love my garden. I love my animals. I love uh, my home. I love the way that my life is. And it does not include um, necessarily anything romantic. But it's also um, a newish place to be because I've been in romantic relationships for my entire adult life. So it's strange to navigate now of like, oh, purposely not doing that. How are you with loneliness? And how much of that was a male connection, any connection, like it's interesting to de- un- de- mm. de- parse this stuff of like, what yeah. was that? Did I want, was I just horny? Was it, what is the compulsion to be with another person? It is compulsion, it's compulsory heterosexuality that was impressed on me as a ch- from childhood on. Mm. Like I wasn't complete without a relationship, whether that was with a man or a woman, it was just like, I was not complete without some kind of romantic relationship happening somewhere. So, um, in compulsive, uh, compulsory, it's more compulsory heter, so comp het. And you think it's heter, it's more heterosexual. It's more than, heteronormative. Than any, yeah. It's more like you've got to, your biological click, talk, clock is ticking. You got to get with somebody quickly. When did you realize you didn't want kids? Or did you realize? Oh, I realized early on, but I also later on had a, an extinction burst of like, oh, maybe I should do this in my 40s. I thought, oh, maybe I should do this. But then I realized, oh, that's not for me. How long did that last? Just a few months. Great. Did you do anything crazy? No. <laughs> you have a couple websites. Should we go and look and eggs and heavy <laughs> stuff? Um, 
And do you think that that compulsory, there are times where I think there's a lot of downside to it. Mm. Like there's a lot of, compared to you at, at 25 years ago versus now, which person is happy or more content? And because it's this, it's this drive that you don't even, like, why do I have this? Yeah. And then now you can sort of think clearly. Mm -hmm. And do you think this person, or what I would consider thinking clearly, although it's just different chemicals. It's just different hormones. Yeah. It's just all hormonal. It's so weird how we're just a weird chemical set, like chemistry experiment happening all the time. And we think it's our personality. Yeah. And we think it's our destiny. Yeah. But it's just a bunch of weird chemical reactions. Yeah. And I I say that not even being nihilistic about it. I'm like, man, this is just chemicals. It's a good realization to have. Yeah. Where you realize like, no, this isn't, this is temporary. Mm -hmm. And if I ride it out, you can kind of overcome anything. Totally. Do Are there points in your life where you wish you had that sort of clarity or is it like, yeah, it's just what I was going through? I wish I had that kind of clarity mm. back then that I could have like uh, really not been in so much of a hurry to be married or be in a relationship or endure things that weren't right. You know, so I think... Um, Really, now I'm much happier than I was then. Yeah, because it is, you want stuff that you don't even know why you want it. Yeah. And you're in a hurry. Such a, yeah, it's such a You're in a hurry, thing. like thinking about when you say it was in a hurry, yeah, you did have more of a frantic energy, mm-hmm. but it was like, not frantic in an off-putting way, but just like. With like an urgency. Engaged, yeah. It's like, an urgency to, I want to get to the next thing. I want to get to the next thing. What's the next thing? You know, this thing of the next thing will make me happy. When I get this, I'll be happy. Yeah. That. Did any of it work? No. (laughs) No. No matter what. But you're grateful for the money in the house and all that stuff. Oh, the best. Yeah. The best. That's the doubt. That's the weird part about it. It's like, eh. But at the same time, this is great. And now I can be calm Mm -hmm. with all these trappings that I got from being a a frantic, um, crazy person. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, you know how the whole premise of the show is people talking about what makes them feel like something's wrong with them? And then I act as a therapist. Let's be honest, that's what's happening here. If you would like to sort of be on blocks, but not really, and not be recorded, and et cetera, et cetera, go to therapy. It's a great way to connect with somebody in a non-judgmental way. We all carry around just different stressors, big and small. It's part of being human. It's not that easy. You got to get a little help. I've gone to therapy for 20 years plus probably at this point. Uh, we don't talk about my age and I don't understand time, but I, it seems like I've been going a long time and it's helped me a lot. The biggest thing it did was establish boundaries in my life. Very hard. It feels scary. And going to therapy helped me do it again you don't have to be the victim of a major trauma to qualify to go to therapy it's if you have any sort of mental or emotional sort of wind in your face like they can help you therapy empowers you to be the best version of yourself if you're thinking of starting therapy give better help a try it's entirely online it's designed to be convenient flexible and suited to your schedule just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot C-O-M slash N-E-A-L today to get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Neil. BetterHelp dot com slash Neil. Go to therapy. I'm telling you, you'll be better off with better help. Man, you nailed it. Nailed it again. Think you've mastered the look in sweatpants and joggers? You're one step away from pajamas in public, you idiot. Your significant other said that you look like a slob. She DM'd me. Don't worry about that. It's time to show your sexy ass in jeans. If you take anything from our show today, it's that the perfect jean isn't just another pair of stiff, 
uncomfortable, nut-crushing pants. They've cracked the code to solving all your denim difficulties. The Perfect Jean makes great-looking, perfect-fitting jeans that are as comfortable as sweatpants and more stretchy than a kangaroo's wazoo. It's made from a special denim fabric that's super soft, just like sweatpants and joggers, but doesn't make you look like a slob. Again, your girlfriend's words, not mine. And the best part, they make six fits from skinny to thick thick waist sizes from 26 to 50 and lengths from 26 to 38 so whether you're a thick daddy short king or anything in between they perfectly fit your body and accentuate your assets pun intended you know my pun policy i intend them all again this is my personal endorsement they sent me some and i didn't know if they were going to keep sponsoring but i kept wearing them because they're good ass jeans look no love lost you don't want to advertise Five of me, still love the jeans, still love what you're about, okay? They're stretchy, they make my ass look legitimately good. I don't have the best ass, but I'm working on it, and it's something that I'm a little bit proud of, if you wanna know the truth. There, there's the truth. It's finally time to stop crushing your balls in uncomfortable jeans by going to the perfectgene.nyc. My listeners get 15% off your first order, plus free shipping, free returns, and free exchanges when you use code Neil15 at checkout. That's 15% off for new customers at the perfectgene.nyc with promo code Neil15. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Fuck your khakis. You know, I'm always saying that. I was saying that before they sponsored. And get the perfect gene. Promo code Neil15. Perfectgene.nyc. Okay, let's do some blocks. Germophobia. You gave me a kiss. Thank you. Yes. And I, your dog licked my hand. Yes. So it's pretty cool. I'm a little more relaxed today about it. Sometimes I get really freaked out. Tell me. Like if you're, you know, during COVID, I was so wi- wiping down my groceries. Like one of those, I was so paranoid and so freaked out. Like it just, everything was alive with bacteria and viruses. And I was so nervous to even just take a breath you know, anywhere. I was so scared. I think, um, you know, and I still, I haven't gotten it COVID at all yet. I'm like, it's so weird, but I think part of my, my just crazy fear around it, I've been a lot more relaxed in the last few months, but my germophobia would really keep What's me What's funny is there are people that won't get it. Like they're, you're genetically predisposed to mm-hmm. not get it. I'm sure you've looked it up. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've looked it all up. Yeah. Uh, um, but when, was that always? Did you always have that? I think it's it's something that just was unlocked during the pandemic, but it always kind of had been there. Like it, it it's a little bit, I was not as bad OCD as some people, but I know that like there's just a, a phobia of things that I have around just like germs and, and whatever. Like, and it's very, uh, it also stems like from working a lot around um, people who are unhoused. So I did a lot of work with the unhoused in the early part of like the 2010s, 11s, 12th, that, that time. And it was just so. You're doing street sweeps? You're getting them off? I'm kidding. No. You're taking a snow shovel and getting them out of your neighborhood? No, it's, it's just like feeding people and dealing with like cash. You know, I would do like these GoFundMes and then take the cash and give it to just directly to people who are unhoused, you know, just to like spread it around. And and then we'd have these huge parties in the street where we were like playing music and doing comedy and stuff, which was really fun. But then it was also started to freak me out, like how dirty everything was, how dirty I was. There's something funny about that. Cash is, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. Where were you doing these? San Francisco, which is the most dirty city. Yeah, it's filthy. I mean, it's incredibly dirty. And it's like, I can't, I get really freaked out. Like, and I start, if I'm walking in the street, even like walking here, like walking anywhere in Hollywood, there's so much shit in the street. Mm-hmm. I freak out. I will, re- I I have a phobia and um, a deep interest in feces. And I can't look away. I have to, if there's feces on the street, I have to look at it and I have to think about it. What do you think about it? I think about what asshole it came from. I think about the composition of the food that was was <laughs> making up the feces. Um, also, saliva. Any kind of saliva in the street, I have to look at it. I cannot. Saliva. That's hard to pick out. It's there. There's I a lot of mucus. I believe you. I trust you. 
I mean, so it's like a very deep. Do you picture it coming out of the show? It was. It was. Yes. Show? It was it yes, was I definitely picture it coming out of the asshole. on that location. Yeah. Okay, and, and you go like, was asked, it at night? Was it what was? Is it human? Do you is assume it, it's a guy? It's always a guy. <laughs> Are you? Well, I guess I feel like I've seen feet women shitting on the street. Yeah, but I just that's not my immediate Oh, that's not impulse. what you're that's not the feces you're drawn to. No. The I'm drawn to some male feces, but it's like really like this intense thing of like I think about it. Even like the park I go to the park every day with my dog here and um if there's feces on the grass, I will then pick it up. Like I have to pick it up and get rid of it. I was going to ask you, have you clawed other feces another like not cl- like would you do you feel the need to like mush it i haven't mushed it but i really <laughs> try to keep it in the same shape and then i have to like get rid of it because it's my park so i have to get rid right. of it and um and then i have still memories so you walk around with lots of bags, bags yeah um i still have memories of where shits happened <laughs> and i think about them and they're burned like scars all over the park. So I can't look at the park without seeing all the shit that used to be there. God damn it, human beings. Can you believe we're <laughs> like this? It's so, and is this a new thing or an old thing? This is more, I think, old. This is a, this is an old pattern. It's prehistoric. Yeah, this is this has been going on, I think, since I was a kid. From from like the initial, uh, oh, not a kid, but like going to Hate Street in San Francisco, which uh-huh. has always been filthy, yep. always full of shit. And also going to Paris as a teenager. Paris, somebody made a video that Paris is the hood. First of all, Paris stink. It smell like piss, cheese, and armpit. And it's he's showing how fucked up Paris is. Yeah, it's and all right. shit. There's so yeah. much shit everywhere. It's just, just watch your step. Well, that's fun for like the diet portion of what you think the shit is. Like, was it a baguette? Yeah. Was it? Because you can definitely see like what's in there. Like you can see if it's runny, if it's shiny, if it's um, too loose, mm-hmm. too loose, Lautrec, mm-hmm. too loose. <laughs> is it too loose? Uh huh. Um, is it? Is there uh, parasites? Interesting. Because you and this is a thing you've just accepted by yourself <laughs> and like. Well, not a blog, by the way. It, germaphobe and fecal phobia, fecal fecal phonia. Fecal phonia, it is, it's not exactly phobia. It's a- It's a phone, what's the one where you like it? I think it's a- Fecophonia. Something like that. Yeah, it's my favorite Outcast album as well. <laughs> um, uh, all right, so germaphobe, so you're, you tried, it's you not like you tried to help and you were like, ah, oh, I'm grossed out by this. Or it's like, there's a weird attraction. It's to, attraction and it's also, I have to help. It's attraction, but also, but I don't pick it up if it's not in my park. If it's not in my park, I'm not picking it up because I don't have ownership of that street. So if it's outside of the park, then it's extreme revulsion. But if it's in the part outside the park, you're like, okay. I have to. I'm like, if it's in the park, well, I have a duty. You don't seem like you seem uh, very ethical, but based on, it's not religious, it's not pious, it's not like superior. No. It's just like, yeah, do a thing for the homeless. Yeah. yeah. Or um pick up shit or yeah. whatever. It's not it did you grow up religious or no? Um so, well my grandparents were uh heads of the Korean church, but that's not where it comes from. I think it's like I just like to do things that are good. It's like I try to do esteemable acts, things that will build my own self esteem, like doing things that are just morally right in my opinion. Is that from a twelve step program? That can be, yeah. But like, be. is that kind of where you got it or yeah. you just got yeah, it? Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's, when did you start thinking that esteemable acts were a thing that that were worth pursuing? I think probably in the 90s when I was really first introduced to the idea of sobriety and like trying to live sober and trying to clean up my life and also not be depressed and look for ways to uplift my ego that were healthy Mm. so you think that there's a component of ego to it yeah to esteemable acts yeah but it's it's good it's it's like yeah it's like all right if you're gonna have a big ego be like 
help people. Yeah. And then that's a way to feed your ego outside of like things like show business, which is like feeding your ego in a way that is, um, I don't know, like I think of like how fame can be really, uh, I've never achieved like the great heights of fame that I've seen mm -hmm. other people. Yeah. And I've seen it really rot people from the inside out. Almost all of them. Yeah. Because it's unfillable. Yeah. So it's weird. Yeah. So I always think, well, if I ever achieved that kind of fame, I, I would would want to make sure that I safeguard my own ego so it doesn't get out of control. Mm -hmm. So oh yeah, it's like you give it to other people to like tell me how to feel mm -hmm. about myself all the time. Yeah, and that's a very dangerous place to be. I think that's why child actors have a hard time overcoming that, and they have a hard time in later life, and especially if they can't achieve the same heights that they did as a child yeah you know well they're they're closed off from it. it's like no yeah. your body changed mm -hmm. and all that the your supply is shut yeah we can't give it to you anymore yeah and that's smart i mean like that's yeah. a that's a that was a good move i think so just because i was really on the cusp of being that because i achieved my own level of fame success fairly early yeah and you know i started comedy at 14 and I was oh, I readily know. being like, a, like applauded at like seventeen, eighteen as a headliner. Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to uh, really um, look back at my life and think, okay, well, actually, fame doesn't solve anything. People still think that it does, even in adulthood. Like when you're kind of trying to achieve these things, you think, oh, if I get this, I'll, I'll be okay. Yeah. And it really isn't like that. I know it's so hard to believe though, because mm -hmm. it looks like it would yeah it really looks like it would and then what do you make of like what you have achieved in terms of that was the right amount or that was meant to be or is there is there any part of you that looks at it spiritually like do you have a spiritual practice at all i do have a spiritual practice and i think it was all meant to be you know and it's all really a good uh a lucky everything has been lucky and really I'm glad they happened the way they happened. And, um, you know, I think about like how uh, I've been able to overall maintain kind of an even a level head about it, which is good. Were you a big drinker or drug user? Yes. Go on. Well, I have a, a couple of different engagements with sobriety. Like I... Uh, got sober initially in the mid 90s because I was having a really bad problem with alcohol and drugs. And um, so then I got sober and um, my life started to go really well. You know, when I moved to New York for a while and I did uh, shows off Broadway there and it was really, really great. And um, I got married and everything was really amazing. But then I uh, started to realize that um, I wanted to improve my life more. So I became uh, vegan. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to become a raw vegan. And then I'm going to become a raw vegan chef. And I'm going to start, <laughs> I just start sprouting my grains before I eat them. All Are the feces coming back? I feel like there's so much are... feces. <laughs> and um, I started going to these camps where I would just like fast for like weeks. And then, I lost my mind. Like I just got so rigid about this idea of like, I'm gonna be pure. I'm not gonna have any chemicals in my system. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm there uh, like with all of these, also like the old celebrities who I cannot name, mm -hmm. but <laughs> very good like other like people in show business who were just like, we're all like in the desert and we're just like uh, trying to, read ourselves of everything and I just couldn't do it and so I went came back to LA after one of those what was the breaking point was there a moment of like this is so stupid I have to stop I uh well I got in a business with another woman who was engaged in all this with me and she tanked the, your it. vegan chef yeah business? <laughs> it wasn't a, it was it was something else but she tanked it and I was so mad at her that I was like I used that to just kind of like go off and then I went downtown and somebody handed me this Jamba juice filled with psilocybin mushrooms, and I drank the whole thing. And I was not right in the head for a while. After How long? That. It took about 13 years. 
to kind of come down off of that. That if anyone had paused it and said how long, I would not have, I wouldn't have even put 13 years as one of the options for how long it took. 13 it took years. 13 years right, to snap out of What's the first it. eight hours of after you drink the Jamba Juice? So, you, so you're you, yeah. you're a successful comedian. Yeah. You're famous, you've done shows, you, I'm the one that I want, all the popular yeah. specials. And you then you kind of go and you're living a extreme alternative life. Yeah. You start some kind of weird business. Look it up if you want. <laughs> and the woman tanks it. And then you're furious. Furious. You go downtown. What, where downtown? It was this party that I had. Um, I used to have one of those egg chairs, mm -hmm. you know, that has like stereos inside. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Sure. Uh, Mid-century thing. So I gave it to this artist and he made an installation of it. And so we, I was going to the, the gallery to see it. And uh, I don't remember who it was. Somebody just handed me a psilocybin drink and I just drank the whole thing. And it's like- Knowing what it was. Knowing what it was. And being- Full well. Was this breaking your sobriety or yeah, had you done- totally breaking my sobriety. Totally, over after 10 years. Yeah, total, seven years. Totally. Uh, and But not only that, I wasn't eating sugar- I wasn't eating. So it was a lot. It was everything <laughs> and nothing processed. Everything uh, would just went down, went down. And after that, I just didn't go. I was like out for 13 years. That's out of my recent, mind. recent, fairly recently. Well, so, uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so 2016, 2016, I finally came to my senses or it was brought to my senses. What were the 13 years like? I was just drinking and on oh, drugs. Oh, you like, went back into yeah, a credit crazy addiction, and 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 probably still high from the psilocybin mushrooms. Like, probably still out of it. Like, I think that. What do you think it did to you? If you could part, if you could guess, it was just like I had lived so rigidly, like as this monastic life for seven years, and thinking like I'm going to be, which in and of itself is its own crazy addiction and totally its own crazy. like. I like it. I like fasting. I li like like mm -hmm. the Catholic in me mm -hmm. likes the sort of self-flagellation yeah. part of it. Yeah, yeah. And you then you really did it. I did. I did it. And then it was. Did you the feel other way. better, or did do you even remember how you felt physically? Is it when people go, "Do you feel better because I'm vegan?" I'm like, "Not really." I did. You did feel better. I did. I think that there was things about it that I thought was really. Um, remarkable what was also weird was things that were very wrong which were like i didn't realize like i stopped having a period for several several years during that like which is really weird yeah um that shouldn't happen especially in my 20s at that time you know um i just uh, i uh just stopped really understanding what <laughs> what everything was like made for like i was so like outside of the realm of being able to do anything. But you're still a comedian, right? Yeah, yeah. You still do comedy. And it's going great? Yeah, it's going great. And, but you, but off stage, it's like. Just so rigid. You couldn't eat were anything. Were they in Tupperware? Like, were everything glass? was in, everything was in like, well, tup probably Tupperware plastic. So that I didn't have like a thought about like recycling or anything like uh -huh. that or plastic. Um, but I could, you just couldn't go to restaurants. You couldn't go, you couldn't have anything at a club. There was just nothing you, nothing there for you. Nothing, anything possible. Did you feel righteous? No, I just felt so removed from any real ability to engage with society. But did that make you feel righteous or you just felt uh, alienated? Probably alienated. A bit righteous at first, but then alienated. But then I was also around people who were doing the same thing. So all my friends were also trying to like be raw vegans as well. Yeah, I mean, whenever I walk past a raw vegan place, I'm like, what's that place on uh, West Third in New York? It was like Rainbow. It was by NYU, but it was there forever. Mm -hmm. And the thing about raw vegans, they don't look healthy. No, they none of them look healthy. They very, look pallid it, and sad. It's just there's a it's just a, a life of strife. And I was doing a lot of yoga, and then I thought, oh, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna be a yoga teacher. And then I was taking all of these classes from. Bikram, who was actual so, Bikram, actual Bikram, who was so mean. It's not what the documentaries. Are, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was so mean. The women of the trash. Yeah, I pick them from trash and give them life. And uh, so abusive to all the students and everybody trying to like become a teacher, and the place stunk like 
In New York or LA? In LA. Just stunk like you of know, sweaty people. Asses. And feces. Mm, and lots feces. of feces. <laughs> Ladies. So much. Uh, uh yeah, this is what I mean. Like you're interesting. You make it, I've you've never not been interesting. Really. I don't even know that. <laughs> yeah. And did the what? Tell me the first eight hours of the mushrooms. Well, I was so high, and then I came back to my house, and um, everybody was kind of like looking at me, like uh, my husband was looking, like what? The, that's so weird that you did that. And then um, my animals were just really scared. I had three dogs, and they were like all like something something's very wrong and they would just avoided you yeah they just didn't want to they didn't want to talk to me <laughs> they didn't want to be petted they didn't want anything to do with me and i was just out of it and it took me a long time to sort of not be really altered from that trip but then it just gave me the permission to do any drug and eat anything after that and did you was any of it enjoyable yeah yeah <laughs> totally yeah well that's the thing with drugs and alcohol and food it's like it's enjoyable, but it's also not because it's just like it's enjoyable for the initial first part. But then it just becomes really like, oh, you want more or you're trying to not be hung over or whatever. Oh, it's all a reaction to the for the thing you did most yeah. recently. Yeah. So it's just trying to get that balance of whatever chemicals. Right. And I could never do it. I could never quite achieve what was good about the high that I remembered, what was good about this, what was good about this. And did that husband leave you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We split up. Great. And uh, good for him. Good. <laughs> and did you, did anyone along the way going, hey? Let's... Yeah. Yeah. And also, that that's what happened. After 13 years, my friends were like, that's enough. And I got uh, kidnapped and I went to treatment. And I stayed in my facility um, on Mulholland, a very nice place. Sure. Um, How I much a there. month? Uh, oh God, it was a lot. It was like yeah. 30000 I was going to guess that. Um, but I stayed there for a year and nine months. That's comedy money there, guys. It's, <laughs> it's, it's where a lot of money went, but it was really worth it. I mean, what's your life worth? You know, like I Yeah, thought, no, of course. And what did you, why did you stay at the facility so long? I uh, really, I really thrive in an institution. <laughs> like, it's where I belong. It's where I really am at my best. <laughs> what part of it? Everything. Like I love the pro what was it? Was it regimented? Yeah, there was group meals. There was group meditation. There was uh, a lot of physical exercise. There was. Um, you know, there's hot people around. There's people who are just a mess that are just fun to watch. Who there must have been people that went in with you, got sober, left, fell off the wagon, and went back. Yeah, there's a lot of that. But then nowadays, they would just die because of fentanyl? fentanyl. Yeah, yeah, fentanyl took out about eighteen of the people that I was with in the facility, and then um, some people just would go downstairs and hang themselves. In the facility. Yeah. And it was like, oh, okay. And was it like the, the polyamory thing where like there's rooms here? Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of places. My business. You know, you can do that here because we <laughs> don't know what's happening. But just stuff like that would happen or, you know, they would just, uh, yeah, they would just drink themselves to death, which is horrible. And a couple of people fell in their house and they just died, you know, like. What do you think it is? Uh, meaning it's a very broad question, but like you just think it's a disease like a dizzy, like a, a just, it's hard. I think some people are in bodies that are very hard experiences. Yeah. And they they self-soothe, so to speak. They're self-soothing. Also, like my theory is that plants are trying to kill us. Like all of like the, mo this. the like most this. harmful things are plant-based. So, except fentanyl is not, but the idea of fentanyl is plant-based. Like it's op opiates. And opiates are trying to, like the, I, but you, the, these plants in their normal form kind of couldn't kill us. No, but they're trying to evolve through science to murder us so that we can go back to the earth and fertilize them to regenerate. I'm sure you've heard that thing about cats. There's a cat, there's a virus that cats can implant in people, mm -hmm. a brain virus. Mm -hmm. that It's basically, it's like a long, it's like a thousand year play from felines mm. to get a, to so they can eat us. I like that. 
I'm sure you do. I, I knew like I knew you get a kick out of it. I like that. Uh, <laughs> it's so funny that the and do you actually? I I can't disprove your plant theory. Well, it's like grapes, like you know, produce alcohol, mm-hmm. so that they're like really just trying to. It's a long game of trying to get us in the ground so they can eat us. I d- disprove it. <laughs> How much do you think you're paying in subscriptions every month? The answer is, let me answer it for you because I'm a white man, so I'm a late arriving instant expert. I have an answer for everything. The answer is you're probably paying more than you think. Over 74% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about. I definitely did. I was subscribing to a streaming service and I was subscribing to a tier of streaming service, that a commercial free version that I did not need. And thanks to Rocket Money, I'm no longer wasting money on the on that uh, thank you, Rocket Money. By the way, I'm and I'm pretty good with tracking, but uh, this one slipped through. Uh, this one, this one slipped through. Didn't I slept? It slipped. Now that I'm using Rocket Money, I can sleep and it doesn't slip because uh, Rocket Money does it all for me, so I don't have to worry about it. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. Duh. Put it in an index fund, kids. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash N-E-A-L. That's rocketmoney.com slash N-E-A-L. Rocketmoney.com slash N-E-A-L. Ditch the meal planning woes and get into HelloFresh's biggest menu yet with over 45 recipes and even more market items to choose from every single week. Make restaurant quality meals at home without the high cost of takeout Plus, HelloFresh's new Ready in 20 recipes are on the table in just, you guessed it, 20 minutes. That's even quicker than delivery. In fact, it's way quicker than delivery. I've got horror stories. Get in touch with me personally. I'll tell them to you. Guys, you know I've got a lady in my life, and she's got a kid because I I don't see situations. I see people, and I guess I'm a hero, whatever. But uh, it's a lot more cooking at home than I'm used to, and uh, we started doing HelloFresh. Uh, there's a chicken thing the kid likes. He doesn't. He's not vegan like me. He's not a great man. Uh, my girl also eats eggs and she, whatever. She's not the most. She says she's vegan. She's not. But there's stuff for me too. There's also like we get uh, hummus and we get a tofu for me and some chickpeas and uh, dal. I could go on. It's good. We get. They send it to us. We cook it up. It's quick. The kids sitting there watching the iPad. You you've seen how it goes now. It's. Excellent. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Neil Sweet, N-E-A-L-S-W-E-E-T, for free dessert for life. One dessert item per box while subscription is active. That's free dessert for life at HelloFresh.com slash N-E-A-L-S-W-E-E-T. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Did two different videos in that. Did you hear the number one? I did a bit of Alan Thick. Alan Thick here. And I also did the ABC Sunday night movie from the 80s. God, man, what a read, Neil. Neil, you've done it again. All right. But that was germophobia, guys. That was block number one. Let's do depression very quickly. Okay. Tell me about your 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 experience with that. Well, I think like it's just an outlook. Like I realized after a lifetime of depression and trying lots of different ways to deal with it, like therapy and group therapy and meds and all sorts of solutions. And I realize now um, the best way I've come, like, and also self-medicating, which is marijuana, alcohol, any of those things or relationships, um, all those things uh, didn't put a dent in it. And now the only thing that works for me is um, I have a really like regimented meditation practice and I exercise. What's the, how, when it's, when you say regimented, what do you mean? I do it twice a day uh, for about half an hour Mm -hmm. and I just sit there Mm -hmm. and that's like, it's hard time to, it's hard to to find the time Mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, But um, I do some different kinds of forms of that and they'll also do like a VR form of it. If I really can't pay attention, Mm. I'll actually put on a headset and do it that way. And that helps. And how often do you exercise? Every day. Just like long walks. And so that's at the park with her. We knew where it was. 
Um, <laughs> where all the shit is. Uh, <laughs> shit park. Um, and that's that's the only thing that's that's the thing that's worked the best. And I sleep about twelve hours a day. <laughs> God damn it, you're interesting. How did you realize like no? Ten's not enough. It's twelve. It's got to be twelve. It's really like, and I have. I mean, it's as as like it can't be every night that I do that, but as much as I can. Why can't it be every night? Because uh, I'll do sets, and then like I'll do sets, and then they'll like it'll be uh, later, and then I'll have to get up earlier to do something. Or if you're like shooting something, you have to get up earlier, and it's hard to, you know, make time to sleep. But if I can, I try to sleep as much as I can. From the outside in, it's I think. A big part of being a human being is figuring out what works for you. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, try something else. Yeah. Don't worry about judgment. No one's paying attention. Mm -hmm. Just sleep 12 hours a day if you have to. Yeah. And walk and put on VR headsets. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're going to do drugs. Yeah. (laughs) And or die or whatever. Like something. So it's like whatever you got to do. That is a good thing that that. Uh, is granted to people trying to get sober is like whatever you have to do is okay because yeah. anything else might kill you. Yeah. Now, yeah. do do sober people try to take advantage of it? They do. Yeah. But I think it's good advice for normal people. Yeah, um, it is. But you tried therapy, mm-hmm. medication, mm-hmm. and probably 10 different pills. and So many th- different kinds of And medicine. the diet thing. And yeah, the, and everything. And it just didn't, just anything like that didn't work. And then I, I realized that, I mean, talk therapy, I could probably go back to, and then I'll do like um, group therapy. And then I have a meditation teacher who, you know, then I'll do longer meditations with with that group. And that's really great. Um, and that's more of a sort of a social thing. How f- It's so fun to just like go to somebody's house and just sit there with people and mm-hmm. not talk. It's yeah. really cool. It's kind of perfect. I love it. A lot of uh, connections is physical. Yeah. Keep me company. Yeah. Feels good to do that. What's the best experience you've had meditating? Meaning how far can you, how far out can you go? I don't know. I mean, it's really like, I can't really, the best is when it feels almost like I'm sleeping. You know, the best is when it feels like a nap and then it's really refreshing, you know, and that's really great. Um, Sometimes I just am fidgeting the whole time. Sometimes I'm just like sitting there thinking like a mile a minute, like just about dumb shit. Mm -hmm. And I can't, but it's like that continual going back to it. It's really amazing how you start to get. And when you don't do it, you miss it and you're like, what's, what did, oh, fuck. Yeah. Well, when I don't do it, then that rigid sensibility of like, oh, what did, you know, that I'm like, why didn't you do it? You have to do it. Like, you know, I get very anxious about not doing it. What's the upside of rigidity? That you do it. That yeah, it, I know. It, it'll it'll give you it's discipline. Yeah, you're yes, and and have you figured out the difference between discipline and rigidity? Because I don't think they're. <laughs> I think that the this, the difference is is just how you look at it. Like you're not uh, punishing yourself for not doing it. That you're not like angry that you didn't do it, or that you're just like frustrated, or that you're like getting to the point where you say fuck it and I don't want to do anything. Yeah, I guess it's also like the what is the goal. Mm. So so you would say that the depression is like in remission, so to speak, or yeah. you've got it sort of like over It's in there. remission because it could definitely come back. And I've had moments or moods where things get, get like, I get disappointed about something. And then like I was disappointed about this um, romantic relationship that uh, didn't work out from about three years ago. Mm-hmm. And I was so disappointed. And I had to really look at why I was so upset about it because I didn't like fucking him at Mm. all. Every time I would go to fuck him, I was like, I hate this the whole time, but I really wanted it to work and it just wasn't going to work. And I was like, why? What what about it? Do you want it to work? You liked him? I liked him him? and I liked being around him and I liked the idea of him more than actually being with him. Mm -hmm. So it was, I was in love with this idea of this person that wasn't really who he was. And so, did he realize that? I don't. I don't think so. Did he ever go like, "Hey, I don't, it was"? I he, think he just wasn't aware. Yeah. And it was so upsetting to me. And I realized it didn't work out because he wasn't who I thought he was, and I was creating this on my own. And then the disappointment of 
the fact that I created this relationship in my head that wasn't real at this age was really like, that was depressing to me. So that took a little bit of more meditation, like made me commit more to this idea of like going and um, taking classes and working out with other people, this concept of silence, like the, the true art of it, like trying to quiet your mind. It's funny, you would think that is the discipline of being uh, getting older is you're like, I can't believe I'm still doing this. Yeah. I fucking can't, I would have thought, and some things do just sort of evaporate. Yeah. Some bad habits, but there are habits where you're like, this, I thought we did this in 96. Um, this is interesting to me, fear of intimacy. Yes. It, do you think uh, polyamory people, and again, you're not a, you, that's one of the things you've tried, but do you think that's a, a symptom of a fear of intimacy? I don't know if it necessarily is, but it, I mean, it can be, anything can be. Hypersexuality is a, mm -hmm. a kind of fear of intimacy thing, tr traditionally. Yeah. You know, when somebody's hypersexual, hyper-focused on sex, that's definitely a way to disassociate from sex, oddly. Yeah. You know, uh, disassociate from intimacy. But I have, I think, uh, my fear of it really is, uh, I think it's like, because every relationship I've, I've been in, I've created a myth of the person that I was with. I never really saw them, you know? And, and I was more reliant on the myth of who they were and uh, trying to stay within that mythology rather than actually getting to know them. How would you do that? Well, it was just like, uh, just being with a person and not really um, allowing them to be themselves or not really accepting when they were themselves or not really getting to know or be with them. And, and part of that is like creating a persona for myself, like feeling like I had to be a person that they might love, mm. you know, like having to perform intimacy rather than actually being intimate with somebody. Was what is it? Is it are you afraid of being rejected? You're afraid yeah. of being boring? What it is is that I'm feeling so um, inherently unlovable that you have to create a person that could be loved in order to achieve that. So I was like creating this persona. Who were some of these personas that you created? Persona would be like, it's really like the cool girl, like yeah. in Gone Girl. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm like a pick me. Like I'm like really down with uh, anything. Yeah. Like I'll def I'll ride road motorcycles without a helmet. Like, you know, I'll definitely, you know, do the, like I'll, I love action films. I yeah. love yeah, yeah, yeah. prog rock. I love like all these things that yeah. I don't like or I don't care for. <laughs> I don't care for at all, but I'll pretend to like them in order for this person who is deeply inter interested in these things to like me. If you knew that he was into motorcycles and prog rock, how, what was your uh, ideation of him? Um, that here's somebody who must be so unique and he's so uh, brave and he's got money to spend on these projects. He's got money to go see Emerson, Lake and Palmer, <laughs> you know, whatever, like he wants uh -huh. to go ride in the desert to go see these bands or, you know, we're going to go ride um, in the Italian Alps and then go, go, you know, go see these rock shows in Valparaiso, whatever. Uh -huh. It's like such a weird fantasy of a person do you find people just sort of disappointingly boring because i feel like that's part of being sober yeah. is just being like life's kind of boring yeah. and people are real regular yeah and moments of like connection are, are sort of rare and magical right. right also as i get older like your hormones are less apt to to want to fuel the fantasy of like wanting to be this person because they are boring and you're Hormones are really, that's where the, the chemical reactions are. Your hormones are creating a person that as a potential partner, a potential mate that seems more exciting than they actually are. Yeah, like poisons our perception mm -hmm. of, yeah, yeah, to think that it's like, this is gonna, and then, and it starts writing fantasies, but like, and then yeah. we're gonna go to the Alps. And, <laughs> it, and, always and then has, it always ends up in the Alps. Of course. It's always <laughs> the Alps or- The Dolomites. The Dolomites, <laughs> always. <laughs> Um, and did you, did you, re what was, did you ever an awakening with that where it was like, what am I, did you ever have sex addiction? 
I don't know if it was ever sex addiction, but I just had a lot of sex mm -hmm. that didn't make sense. Sex that I didn't really enjoy or understand that I was like, what is this even? What is this? Why am even? I doing this? Why am I doing this? Um, Would you say it was hormonal or? No, that was like just sheer out of uh, curiosity. Some of it is also like wanting to be perceived as a free spirit and wanting to be perceived as somebody who was really like kinky and wild. And I accept and appreciate all those things. And there's a part of me that really enjoys it as an mm. aesthetic and also as a lifestyle. And I, I have a lot of really great, lovely friends who are involved in it very deeply. Mm -hmm. But for myself, I'm like, I think a lot of this is performative. Like what my interest is in it is kind of like trying to make somebody think that I like this because I think they are somebody that I might want to be with. It's so interesting because from the outside in it, uh, from the outside in, you, uh, as someone who's never been into any sort of kink stuff, I'm like, I don't, are you, do you, are you really into this or is it, it's impossible to tell who's actually into yeah. it yeah. or, and who's doing it for the Dude, social capital. This. Yeah. And, yeah. and you're saying it was hard to know within yourself. Yeah. It's hard to know because there's like part of me that is attracted to it and part of me that's like, I don't know what's going on. Like I, I really wanted to appear uh, kinky when I was, uh, I was dating this guy who was a uh, unit publicist for, uh, like Dawson's Creek or one of the, one of the mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And he was very into the scene and very, uh, he, he uh, would do these things for me at this like club where uh, he would set my leg on fire. He would put uh, <laughs> and sanitizer on my leg and then light it. And it was like, what? How? In front of people? Yeah, like, yeah it was like a like, performative like thing. A and How I'm like, long would this it is... like, here they come? Did you have a song? Was it like a whole <laughs> thing? Or was it just like a bunch of people hanging out? A and bunch of people you... hanging out. Okay. And uh, and I'm like, what? I don't know what's sexy about this. Like, I, I was just like, and I really, he was great. But I just was like, what is sexy about this? Like, I can't really, I don't understand what's sexual about this. Like. And, and would people compliment you or did you like the feeling it gave you, like the perception of you? I think it was like because it was like, uh, I always love the magician's assistant. Who doesn't? I love the magician's yep. assistant. So that to me was like, it was kind of part of that. Like I was living out the like fantasy or fetish of being the magician's assistant. But at the same time, it was like a false self that I was putting forward that I was like into this because I'm not. There was another guy who... Um, he was cool. He was in his 70s. He had a junk, like a Chinese ship, like a junk. Uh, a Chinese ship. A junk uh, parked in the marina, like a marina del Rey. And so he would, he bought a uh, veterinary su suction machine uh -huh. that was used in surgery. So he rigged it so that it would um, suck on his penis and it would inflate it to the size of basketball. And uh, so he uh, would just have that in his lap. This is part of the same functions that, you know, my leg would get set on fire. This is like one of those things. Oh, and then the guy would be neck a few chairs down with yeah. the machine. Yeah. The, with the, he would leave the junk in the marina, and but he would bring. Something to the, suck his junk. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> to enlarge his junk at uh, the club. And um, he was so interesting. But I'm like, what it? And I'm like, why am I here? What am I yeah. doing here? Have you ever met up with these people afterward and been like, were you really into that? Because I was. Do is there uh, in my head more women do this? And but uh, maybe I'm just wrong. Where it's like they, it's the pick me thing of like, no, I'm I'm cool and I'm 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 sexually permissive and yeah. risk taking and all that stuff. But like, men have more risk taking chemicals than women. Yeah, just naturally. Yeah. So I wonder, is there uh, it doesn't even necessarily need to be gendered, but but it is interesting when you realize, like, was I even into yeah, that? Yeah, I don't think so. But I'm also, it is kind of a pick me thing of like, look, I'm so cool, I'm so free spirited and open minded. Look at the places I go, but then I look back and I'm like, well, I appreciate it. Now I do things like um, 
you know, I, I definitely uh, have done a lot of different things in the BDSM community, like work as a documentarian and do mm -hmm. different things. And like I see things that are just so amazing and I love it, but I don't know if I would like it. Like stuff with Do you like, believe that the people that say they like it actually like it? Yeah. Can you tell the difference? Yeah, because they're they're engaged in it and you know we see them and they're like using cactus in their pain play mm -hmm. and um stuff and i'm like that's great you know i love that people are using plants who are trying to, <laughs> kill, trying us. to kill it yeah it, it serves a lot of needs for you. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes sense to me or, or like duct tape duct tape is a one a weird one there was a guy that would like wrap his whole body in duct tape and then just stick it and unstick it like a mummy <laughs> but stick it and unstick it inside his like encasement okay. and it was just about the sound of stick would he and be stick. hard um i couldn't really tell but i think that was the goal yeah it always is yeah um well you don't seem insecure to me do you know what i mean mm -hmm. like i guess that would that behavior would be born out of insecurity yeah but you seem really not confident in who you're just accepting of who you are was that yeah. like did you come to that over yeah, time i think i came to that over I, I mean, I think I've I've just really come had to sort of maybe drilled into my head about like self acceptance around, especially when I was in rehab. That was a big part of it is learning to just be in acceptance around. It's funny because when did life. you had a special called "I'm the One That I Want"? When did that come out? <laughs> well, that was in 2000. But this so, is kind of before you were. Yeah. The one that you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, a lot of that was like trying to do stand-up comedy in the way that I would want to be perceived as a person. Like, I'm trying to do comedy, create a persona on stage, that somebody that I would like to be. So that's sort of another Was that clear? Was that part of the show? It was, it, it seemed, I was convinced by yeah. who you said you were. I'm still trying, still, still trying to even like match the confidence of that person. Even now, like I think I had a lot of confidence then maybe too because I was sober then. And I yeah. was um, trying to achieve this goal of being like free of any poisons, free of any chemicals, free of any meat, free of any dairy, free of any like things that would be harmful. How much less insecure would you like to be? How much is left? Like, how, you know what I mean? I think that there's now it's more like, oh, can I still engage in society as an older person? You know, can I still? Oh, interesting. Can I still do this as a you know, fifty-five? Are you year old? still viable? Yeah, am I still viable? Am I still relevant? Am I still able to do this? Because I still feel young. Yeah, I still think of you as young. Yeah, like uh, it, despite words like trailblazer. <laughs> Again, one of the the uh, contradictions with built within you, insomnia. Yeah. How? If you're sleeping twelve hours a day. Well, I'm not. It's like you, you. The goal is twelve hours a day, but then it's like trying to make yourself actually sleep. Oh, all right. So you're let you try to be in bed for twelve hours. Yeah, got it. And yeah. what do you have a sleep timer, or watch, or anything? Um, sometimes, but usually, like I try to get in bed around. If I'm not doing a show, I'm trying to get bed around eight. Okay. And then get up around eight, trying. It's fun. I believe that most women would go to bed at eight if they could. I love it. I know. You, women love going to bed early. It's... But I have to like not look at TV. I have to not look at my phone. I can't bring any devices in the if fucking vicinity. Yeah. I have to practice some kind of sleep You must hygiene. have so much free time not being uh, focused on sex. Yeah. It must be two hours a day <laughs> of like just time that you uh, that you need to know. Yeah. Because it is it's like a commute. Right. Of like, I have to service this hormone mm -hmm. and now it's for, and now you don't have to do it anymore. Yeah. Do you feel less feminine or less, like, do you miss this sort of game of it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, no, because it was so uh, intertwined with self-worth and am I worthy and am I worthy to be seen or can I be seen and... Um, what do I have to do to myself to present myself? Like, how do I even present to be seen? Like, what is it? What? It, how do I maximize my appeal? You know, all that stuff is really not there. And do you resent it? Or are you just like, yeah, it's what I was doing? 
oh yeah, it's just what I was doing is what I was like thinking about. And but now I realize, oh, that's really duct tape is a one duct tape is a one. What do you think serves you? Um, I think now it's just enjoying every aspect of life. Like, and I really enjoy myself. Like, I really love my home. I love my animals. I love when I get to do comedy. I love to just travel around and do stuff. And I love to act. And, you know, all that's really enjoyable. More than it ever was. More than it ever was. And you think it's a matter of your focusing on it yeah. or, or perceiving it differently? It's that I'm looking at it not as a means to get anything else. You know, it's not mm-hmm. as like my home I'm enjoying, not as a means to open it up and share it with somebody, mm-hmm. not as a means to sh- show off how great it is. It's not a, as any of that. It's it's really, I just love sitting in here. I love it. You know, make music and it's not uh, any kind of like thought of like, oh, I'm doing this in order for it to go somewhere. I just love making it. I love the physical sound of, the instruments I play and the the way that my voice sounds when I sing. So, And the thing you're saying now, I'm assuming there are times where you're like, this is stupid, this is boring, this is, but for the most part, it it is just for its own sake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a gift. Yeah. If you can get there. Yeah. But you gotta go to rehab for a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then finally, we have imposter syndrome, which I yes. feel like we've been kind of talking about anyway. But if you start stand up when you're 14, who's a real stand up? Yeah, who like, is? Like who, meaning who if is? you're an imposter, who's who? Who's a real yeah, one? It's so weird. I don't know. This is, but the imposter syndrome is like, that's why I never want to do a set at um, any award show. Because you're fucking trying to do a set in front of people who all are sitting there in their own imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. which is the worst audience. <laughs> well, they're not. They're thinking about how they look if I look signal and they, they cut to me and. Uh, yeah. Or do I even deserve to be here? Yeah. Or like or if I might. And if they're if somebody's making a joke about them, it's like all adding insult to the already yeah. injury injurious state of imposter syndrome. Yeah. So it's like a horrible situation. When did you hear the term imposter syndrome and be like, oh, I think that's me? I don't quite remember. I think it comes from like probably in the 80s listening to Elvis Costello, who I love, Mm -hmm. who uh, sort of references the sort of the idea of imposter syndrome a lot in his music. And um, then this idea of like, do I even belong? Like, do I even belong? And I think all comedians have that to some extent. Like, do I even belong? What what, you know, what is this even? So it's like, uh, I don't know, it's a continual thing. Now I've just kind of tried to push it to the side. Also trying to do other things like, I, you know, make music or acting. Like I'm always trying to like, oh, I'm good enough to be here. I should be here. I, I, can, do, I can do this. Well, also nothing is impossible. Oh, mm-hmm. or I will say, you know what's impossible? Stand up. Yeah. And you did it. Mm-hmm. So anything beyond that is yeah. like a lot of acting is mostly memorization mm-hmm. and looking how you look and not flipping out yeah. when there's a camera on you yeah. and not acting squirrely or like yeah. just being a don't spaz out. But I'm saying, how did you get to the thing of like, I'm not a product, it, meaning not even a product, like opening the door at your house and not imagining architectural digest. Uh-huh. coming in mm-hmm. when did you get to like no i'm really living a life that is not for consumption um i feel like that is almost more recent than anything like that is more like can i just enjoy life without this thought of having to be productive or like can i just enjoy my time without having to think like i should be doing something else or um can I just live? You know, like yeah. that's kind of it. And did it, is it hard? Is it a thing you need to sort of practice? Yeah. Yeah. And is it beyond meditation? Is it like a thing where you have to like, Margaret, remember? <laughs> yeah. Just, just fucking set, be a person. Just set, set your mind to that, you know, and s- c- continue to like bring your mind back to, it's okay to just be here. Is it getting easier? Yeah. Yeah, it's really been great to talk to you because I it is your I think what you're experiencing and I'm sure it's I'm sure you have plenty of fuck ups or whatever 
it's something to aspire to, mm-hmm. like where you are, mm-hmm. because it's it's self acceptance and just stop listening to your hormones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> like just uh, you kind of they kind of need to cooperate. They need to shut the fuck up, like mm-hmm. which is hard to make them yeah, do. It's really hard, but if you can get there, it's you're more in control. It's actually you. Mm-hmm. Or the clo- a closer version of actually you than this deluge of nonsense. Mm-hmm. Margaret Cho, ladies and gentlemen.